What's going on guys? I'm Tyler and in continuing my series of Disney movie reviews I'm here to let you know that Aladdin is no perfect movie. But again it would be really awesome if that were the case. And as the majority of you know Aladdin is a young street thief living in Agrabah who comes across a lamp with a genie inside and of course the genie is played by Robin Williams. But once Aladdin realizes the potential that this genie has he uses it in order to attempt to win over Princess Jasmine, who he's recently fallen in love with. And that becomes a real challenge when the Sultan's royal advisor, Jafar, and his pet bird, Iago, discover that he has this lamp, which they've been looking for their entire lives, and they decide to steal it and use it for themselves. Now I'm going to get the most obvious thing about this movie out of the way. The best part, for sure is Robin Williams as the genie. He is absolutely hilarious. He is charming. He brought a smile to my face every time he was on screen. You can tell just how much the directors let him improvise whatever he wanted based on how many impressions and pop culture references you see on screen and how quickly they come and go. I did some research and I found out that Williams was given some topics to improvise off of and once he was done with every single topic, the animators would pick which ones were the best and insert them into the movie. He was basically playing scenes from a hat the entire performance. And they made the wise choice of making Williams's comic persona, this really hyperactive but still brilliant man, essentially the characteristics of the genie. So hyperactive, so full of energy, larger than life. All these things really come as a shock to Aladdin until he realizes just how much power he has stumbled upon. And that's the great thing about each of these characters, their own belief of what power is, the lengths they would go to achieve it, and the consequences that they suffer for that reason. And it's actually what makes the genie a surprisingly thoughtful mentor to Aladdin, because he's seen so many people take his powers for granted, and as he points out, he has infinite power except for control over his own life, which is the thing he really pines for most. And that's actually the thing that Genie and Aladdin really have in common, because that's not to say that Genie completely overshadows the title main character of all people. He doesn't. Aladdin is still the center of the movie, and his arc is the heart of the film, because based on how poor he is, he tries so hard not to view himself as worthless, even though so many people who are higher than him class-wise and status-wise just verbally and sometimes physically torment him over it and it really he really just goes to show how much it goes to his head once he gets this genie he starts to believe all of these things and the fact that he was lying and stealing at the beginning it becomes less about survival and more about serving his own needs but you never think he's too selfish and you still root for him because you know for a fact that he's not worthless he is incredibly strong-willed. He can get himself out of any situation. In fact, he's really good at manipulating people based on the stereotype of how poor he is. He plays, against, plays them against their own emotions, and they're just like, well, this kid's a street rat. He can't trick me. So, sure, I'll go along with it. And that's what gets him out of trouble, and it's the reason that you want to root for him. And you realize that... Dude knows that he's smart and strong and very thoughtful. He just needs someone to encourage those feelings. And once he has the genie and Jasmine in his life, it's the reason those relationships matter the most to him. And what makes Jafar and Iago much more than entertaining villains is that they both feel like they deserve more power in their own lives than they've really been given. Jafar, is easy. To, it's easy to understand why he feels so unhappy with the position he's in. He's the advisor of a complete and utter moron. But the difference is, the Sultan at least acknowledges Jafar's contributions to him as an advisor. Iago does most of Jafar's work and barely gets any acknowledgement for it. Hell, he's the, re he's the one who really slips that pervy mind of like, hey, why don't you marry Jasmine, you become the Sultan, and then you off both of them, which... You can tell he's kind of tempted to be around Jasmine, and that part is gross, but that is kind of the whole point. And that's the other thing. Motivations aside, Jafar and Iago are really entertaining villains. Jonathan Freeman has this deep and slimy, sinister voice that really complements his slender and almost devilish design. Like, 
that beard makes him look a little satanic for me personally. And you know what? I gotta be completely honest. I really like Gilbert Gottfried, and this movie might have really started that off for me. Because at his core, what makes him funny is whenever he screams something based on anger in such an over-the-top fashion. And because Jeff Iago is a character who deserves more than he's treated, it actually makes sense why he's constantly screaming all the time. Thankfully, the writers actually gave him some funny things to say, so that definitely helps too. I'm not entirely sure how Gilbert Gottfried beat out Danny DeVito and Oscar winner Joe Pesci, among many others, but I don't really care because, honestly, Gottfried was just a really entertaining character for me. Now on to the music that we all know and love. It's important to know that this movie was a personal pet project for Howard Ashman, who co-wrote the songs to Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast, and was arguably one of the major driving forces when they were crafting the Disney Renaissance because he was a big producer in Little Mermaid. He was able to hire actors based on their Broadway careers and their singing skills above anything else. And Aladdin was his brainchild. He pitched it before Little Mermaid even came out. It was a lot different than what we ended up getting, and I'll be completely honest, there were a lot of changes made that were kind of necessary. And it is unfortunate that out of the 14 songs that they wrote for the movie, only seven made it in, and three of them were Ashman's, because he passed away halfway through production because of HIV and AIDS, and it's really disappointing that he didn't even get the chance to see Beauty and the Beast be a finished product. But honestly, his three songs that he contributed were actually some of the best, and here's why. Arabian Nights... Prince Ali, Friend Like Me, all of them are fucking Robin Williams songs. And weirdly enough, this was actually the first movie that Tim Rice worked on as a lyricist with Alan Menken, because he would later go on to do Lion King based on the success of this. And it really goes to show, because the Alan Menken and Tim Rice songs are also pretty good too. One Jump Ahead has a really fast rhythm to it, which suits just how quick thinking Aladdin is when he's in trouble. A Whole New World, if you didn't already believe the chemistry between Aladdin and Jasmine, you will after hearing this song because it has such a sweet and charming melody and it sums up how both these characters have one big thing in common. They want control over their own lives, something they feel as if they don't really have unless they're together. And I gotta give major props to Brad Kane and Leah Salonia. I apologize, let me know how to pronounce it as the singing voices of Aladdin and Jasmine, because they actually had voice actors and singing voices. They did a really good job, and you wouldn't even guess that they swapped out one voice for another. That's the best part. And as for Ashman's songs, as expected with anything sung by Robin Williams, they all have really fast-paced energy, they have memorable lyrics, Williams rose to the occasion tremendously. And of course the animators definitely enhanced those songs by being really creative with the genie's magical abilities, inserting so many different characters, different settings, different props that the genie could play off with. Because the animation, while I don't think it's one of the most spectacular or large scale in comparison to other Disney Renaissance movies, it's still really good. The, the magic carpet sequences have these really nice POV shots that make you feel like you're on a roller coaster ride. It's a lot better than the magic carpet ride at Disney World, I can safely say that. And as a Disney princess, Jasmine has a lot going for her. She's very open and honest about how strict her lifestyle is, just how stupid the rules are of her being forced to marry, which really serve no purpose to the kingdom. And the fact that she's so willing to speak her mind at the expense of any trouble is actually what makes her tolerable when she's a damsel in distress. It's not because she's useless, it's because she's willing to fight back, and if the consequence means having to face any repercussions from men who are sexist pigs, she'll take it because it's a lot better than just sitting back and doing nothing. What didn't really work about her was her dialogue. It was really forced and heavy-handed when it came to explaining just how chauvinistic the rules are, and I'm not saying the rules around her are fair. They're not. It's just, it's incredibly blunt and obvious what the message about her character is. You have that great moment where 
she opens up a bird cage and all the birds get to fly free. It's the type of freedom that she wants. If you had more visual motifs like that, then I'd be fine with it. But most of her arc is just explained through exposition, very clunky exposition. And she's not the only character who gets dialogue like that. Aladdin has some moments where Scott Wagner, who does a really good job playing Aladdin, gives it his best shot, but he still can't make those things sound natural. Whenever he's saying, I'm completely worthless without the lamp, it sounds really phoned in. And it's the dialogue that's trying to appeal to kids more than adults. And the sad thing is Linda Larkin as Princess Jasmine gets saddled with most of that dialogue, which is a shame because she's still giving a really good performance. It's just the script that she's given makes her sound unnatural, which is a really unfair thing to do. It's painfully obvious what the messages on, of this movie are already, but thankfully what keeps you invested are the likable characters, the great performances. Robin Williams steals every scene he's in, but the other actors still get their moments to shine. And the music, as a finished product, I think Howard Ashman would be incredibly proud, and Alan Menken and Tim Rice still did a really good job filling in his shoes, because as I keep saying, it's some of Disney's best. And Aladdin is one of Disney's best just because of how charming and entertaining the movie is. So for all those reasons, I'm going to give Aladdin a 4.5 out of 5. Guys, thanks as always for watching. Let me know in the comments below what you thought of Aladdin. And let me know what you thought about the sequels, because I actually didn't watch those as a kid. So be sure to let me know down below. Be sure to stay tuned for more Disney reviews, and be sure to like and subscribe. Take care.